Here we go, and welcome to another episode of Phantology Podcast. Before we get started, if you like our content and want to talk with us more, join our Discord server. You can find that invite link on our Twitter page, at Phantology Books, and we're also available on all other social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, etc., so we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, recently we had somebody that uh, came on and it was on our Red Rising review and made some really good points. We want this to be a discussion. You know, we, we're not experts in these books. We're not like people that pretend to know everything. These are just kind of our experiences as we go through reading these books. So please join the conversation. Tell us why we're wrong. Tell us why we're right. Tell us what you like and what you didn't. Yeah. And I think to kind of like build off of that, by nature of what we do, we read a lot of books. And so that means we kind of go for breadth over depth. So we're going to miss things and we're going to maybe not appreciate and have the same love for books, for certain books that, that you might. And that's okay. There's there's a place for, for that in our Discord where you can kind of just come in and show us why we're wrong. And we're happy to listen to that. Nice. So today we're going to be reviewing the First Law Trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. Starts with the first book called The Blade Itself. So if you're a big fan of the series and want to let us know what we missed, what what you think, feel free to hop on the Discord and, and tell us how it goes. But uh, let's get started here. So this is Steven again, and I've been and Josh on the line. We are excited to review this series. This is one that I think we all read not too long ago, so we should be fairly fresh. And I just barely finished the third book, Last Argument of Kings. I, I read it about a year ago maybe started well i started it early last summer so it's been a while and it was on my uh reading list for a long time so i'm glad i finally got to it last year and it's a pretty memorable series right like this is one that definitely has a a landmark spot in your fantasy bookshelf oh for sure this is this is something that is on uh most you know fantasy reading lists that you come across on the internet it is a series that is appreciated for its grim dark style. I think that uh, George R. R. Martin was maybe the founder of grim dark or started the grim dark mo- movement. But this is a series that encapsulates a lot of grim dark ideas and maybe might even be the hallmark grim dark series out there. I would I would say it is from what I've seen. Joe Abercrombie people call him Lord Grim Dark. Kind of that's his nickname. Uh, and, and yeah, this is definitely the Hallmark series of the grim, dark subgenre of fantasy. So, what is grim, dark for rev- for re- listeners who are not familiar? So, I think grim, dark is best described in terms of being overly violent, and not just violent, but you really have bad things happen to main characters very often, and and those bad things can be anything from, you know, losing limbs to um, losing loves. Like anything that is bad can happen, that can happen, will happen to these characters. So I'll go ahead and read the Wikipedia definition of grimdark. It says grimdark is a subgenre of speculative fiction with a tone, style, or setting that is particularly dystopian, amoral, or violent. The term is inspired by the tagline of the tabletop strategy game warhammer 40,000 and the grim darkness of the near future there's only war so that's interesting i didn't know that here's my here's the description that i've seen that i like the most so a typical fantasy is fantastical in terms of it's it's not reality it's it takes uh you, you suspend belief and you go on this adventure that is outside of anything that we believe is really possible and that's why we love fantasy. Grimdark is the opposite. So we take reality and we say, what if reality was just so realistic and all of the bad things that happen in reality are, are, are that way and there's no suspension of fantasy and we just get down to the, the real um, nuts and bolts of reality. So it's, it's fantastical in that opposite direction as typical fantasy. Yeah, and maybe even... Maybe even worse. I mean, everybody has bad things that happen to them, and a lot of pe- and people have worse things that happen to them than others. But it feels like in this series, it's like every other thing that happens is like a severely negative thing that you know impacts these people's lives. Okay, so grimdark, defined by Phantology Podcast. 
let's jump into the series a little bit. What were your guys' kind of high-level thoughts on the series? Did you like it? Did you not? Let's talk about uh, someone who's coming into the series. Knowing, hearing the description that we just gave, why would someone want to read this series, and who would it appeal to? Yeah, so I think that if you're somebody that loves like gritty war movies, then you're going to love this book or this series. Um, if you're somebody that loves characters, then you're going to love this series. I think that this series had some of the best characters of anything I've read recently. Each character was, I had very vivid images in my mind of each character. I thought I could predict how they would react in most situations. Each character had a very distinct tone and way of thinking. And so I love the characterization that, that happened in this, in this series. Yeah, I agree. This series, it has six main characters. I think that you would qualify and classify as main characters. And every one of them just is utterly fantastic. And they all stand out and they all have their different quirks. They all have their different moral codes, which is really interesting. None of them I would describe as heroes, but they all have a sense of morality that's very defined to them. So yeah, the characters are fantastic. I would say the writing in general, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say this is the second best writing in fantasy. In, fa in fantasy books that I've read and enjoyed, this is the second best. So I think I'm going to try and say what your, what your first best would be. Would that be Name of the Wind? Yeah, so, so Patrick Rothfuss is an amazing just prose constructor in writing, and his writing is beautiful, and it actively adds to the story. And this writing is also very strong. There's a lot of little quirky things that he does with the writing that actively adds to the story. And anytime the writing style and the way it's written adds to the, the visualization and description that I'm getting in the story, that's fantastic in, in my mind. I would say typically what I look for in writing is just not to distract or take anything away from the story. And this actively adds to it. So Second best. Second best writing I've ever read in fantasy. Say one thing for First Law. Say that it has good writing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Um, I also, I listened to the books mostly. I read some of it. And the narrator did a really good job as well. They had very distinct voices for the characters. And one of the characters, like, missing teeth. I don't want to get too into spoilers. But I don't know how he did it, but it sounded like he was talking through every other tooth in his mouth. That was pretty impressive. I agree. Doesn't the the narration, the audio narration, add even more to the story? Because listening to it, you just get the feel of the story, the the gritty nature. I mean, I imagine this narrator is kind of like an older, withered up guy sitting in the back of a tavern, spitting tobacco juice through his through his missing teeth or something, and it just adds to the to the flavor of the story. Oh yeah, I like I listen to a lot of this book while trying to fall asleep, and that is like an exercise in gaining ni nightmares right there because <laughs> it it would keep me up, and and even if I did manage to fall asleep, it would like would the voice would like follow me into my dreams. Yeah, that's that's not a good idea for this series. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been starting to worry that audiobooks are bad for my listening experience. Like I'm not it. Like lately, I haven't been enjoying books quite as much. I've been having more and more negative reviews. But after listening to this book, and I loved the, I, I loved the trilogy. I thought it was, it was very solid. And I'm going to do away with that thought that audiobooks are bad because I listened to all these, and I thought the audiobooks were maybe even better than if I had just read them. I agree. Actually, the first, the first way through, I think I picked up the book and tried to read it a few times and didn't get as engaged. But then when I listened to the audiobook, it was quite captivating. Okay. So that's why you should read. Hopefully, hopefully that's a good advocation for picking up the books and let's do our little content warning. And then we'll spend the rest of our time uh, uh, breaking down all the reasons why you shouldn't read it. <laughs> yeah. So I think that this content rating might be um, some of the reasons why you shouldn't read it. Listen, I almost had to put the book down a few times because of how graphically violent it was. And it was like, 
I mean, you're going to know within the first like 50 pages of the book if this trilogy is for you. I mean, not not to get into too many spoilers, but there's like a torture scene right at the beginning where there's some fingers being chopped off. And I texted, I think, Josh and was like, why am I reading this book? Like, why is this a thing? So you're going to know very quickly whether whether this is for you or not. Well, one of the main viewpoint characters, Glockta, is a torturer. That's his profession. And there are lots of scenes where he's he's doing it and he does it pretty well and there's he likes to cut off fingers. Yeah. And uh and there's I mean there's pretty graphic descriptions of bits of fingers being cut off and and then the horror involved and I mean that's just one thing. There's a lot of war, there's a lot of killing and maiming and yeah, really, really can't really can't say enough about the level of violence here. So yeah, it's it's more violent than Game of Thrones, for sure, I think. Yeah, the Song of Ice and Fire books have some violence to them, but it, it's not... I mean, a, an active part of the book is just the level of violence. That is something that characterizes what the book is. Yeah, so violence. And there, um, there weren't many instances of sex, but when there were, it was graphic. So Right, I, I can only think of two, two main times that that happens. Yeah. And yeah, it's 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 fairly graphic for sure. But but again with the sex, like there there's an element of sexual violence to some of it. And again, it's not like what you would go in and pick up an erotica book or something. It's it it's not like glamorizing sex. It's just graphically describing it. <laughs> again, in a grim dark way if that's possible. In a hyper realistic way, right? Not even in a way that like Lightbringer does it where it is um somewhat extensively talked about but in a way that leaves you feeling just kind of dirty after it not even because it it just it's a grim it's a if you were to say that sex could be described in a grim dark way that would be this book so very high content probably the highest content rating that we could give would go to this book uh no no well that we've done so far but i think stephen king has some has more uh content than these books at least the, the highest content that we reviewed and be, before we stop there's quite a lot of language as well yeah so just be ready it's it's not um for the faint of heart and i wouldn't give it to a kid to read yeah that being said great i mean great trilogy and and great payoffs and if you can get past the violence and gore then you're gonna be in for a treat I mean, some people like it, right? That's part of the appeal. Okay, that's true. That is true. If you're, th- like I said, I have a really hard time watching like war movies because it's just hard for me to watch. It makes me feel uneasy. But if you're somebody that likes it, then you're gonna like love this book. For me, it was something to get through. But for other people, they're gonna they're gonna enjoy that part. So I'm not saying that I liked all of the 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 content and the violence and, and such. But one thing that I really, really attached to me in the series was the level of realism. And I felt that I was able to relate to what was going on and relate to the characters a little bit more because I thought, wow, this is really real. Like if I was going through this, this is probably how I would feel and how it would look. And in a lot of fantasy, it's, it's more, it's, it's more, it's not as realistic, right? It's idealized and the action is really cool and everything just works out great. Um, and coincidences happen that pay off, which is fun to read, but it's not super realistic. This book was realistic, and I, I was able to connect to it stronger. Okay, so I think we should jump into our um, spoiler section of the book. So if you or of the trilogy, so if you have not finished reading the entire trilogy, um, then you might want to stop listening and start reading. So um, I think the best way that we're going to do this is. We're going to read um, a little bit of summary from each book and then um, talk about that briefly and kind of do that for the first, second, and third book. And then we're going to talk about everything as a whole. Yeah. And I guess if you've only read one or two of them, you can listen for a few more minutes and we will, uh, we're, we're just going to read the synopsis on the Wikipedia fandom for each book. So here we go. Book one, The Blade Itself, published in 2006. Logan Nine Fingers, infamous barbarian, has finally run out of luck. Caught in one feud too many, he's on the verge of becoming a dead barbarian. 
leaving nothing behind him but bad songs, dead friends, and a lot of happy enemies. Nobleman Captain Jizal Dan Luthar, dashing officer and paragon of selfishness, has nothing more dangerous in mind than fleecing his friends at cards and dreaming of glory in the fencing circle. But war is brewing, and on the battlefields of the frozen north, they fight by altogether bloodier rules. Inquisitor Glockta, cripple turned torturer, would like nothing better than to see Jazal come home in a box. But then Glockta hates everyone, cutting treason out of the Union one confession at a time, leaves little room for friendship. His latest trail of corpses may lead him right to the rotten heart of the government, if he can stay alive long enough to follow it. Enter the wizard Baez, a bald old man with a terrible temper, and a pathetic assistant. He could be the first of the Magi, he could be a spectacular fraud, but wh whatever he is, he's about to make the lives of Logan, Jazal, and Glockta a lot more difficult. Murderous conspiracies rise to the surface, old scores are ready to be settled, and the line between hero and villain is sharp enough to draw blood. You can just hear the grim, dark, kind of gruesome nature of the series in, in that summary, right? Yeah, and what a way in, in introducing five of the six main characters, if you count Farrah as a main character. It just it gives a great description of each of those characters. And honestly, I kind of wish I would have read that before I started the series. Yeah, I think that part of the reason that it does such a good job in, descri in describing those characters is because those characters are so descriptable, if that makes sense. Like, it's not it's not hard to think about each of those characters and have very like definite things to say about them. Which character did you guys resonate most with, or, or which one was your favorite? I mean, none of these guys are really great characters. They're good characters. They're not good people. But which ones did you think were the strongest? I thought Logan Nine Fingers was probably my favorite, and also the person with the simplest motivations. A lot of times, you know, most of it was just trying to stay alive. And when he wasn't trying to stay alive, he was normally trying to help people. So, yep. Say one thing for Logan Nine Fingers: say he's still alive. <laughs> I I really like Luther. I think he had the most growth throughout the series. I think that he started off as being so immature and just such a pain, but then slowly was willing to take on more responsibility and slowly became a better person. I enjoyed, I don't know if I enjoyed reading his parts the most because they weren't always the most exciting, but I liked his character. I'll agree. I think both of those characters had a lot of growth. Let's not spoil the second and third books quite yet. But some of their growth is a little undone at the end in a somewhat realistic way because not everyone is always growing and progressing. And that's one of the things that I kind of like about the series. It's it, that realism. The character that I resonated most, most with was Glockta. Um, listeners might not know this, but I am also disabled, as is Glockta. And, you know, I thought a lot. You get his thoughts a lot. And let me tell you, it's really realistic the way that he thinks. And some of the kind of messed up thoughts that that come to that that surface sometimes, like that's totally real. So I don't know what Joe Abercrombie's background is, but a lot of Glockta was I could totally see myself in in some of the things that he was doing. Now I'm not, you know, torturing or killing or or doing anything too evil, but yeah, the the description and the thoughts and the the point of views that you get for these characters are all pretty amazing. They're they're real people. I really enjoyed Glockta because he was like kind of addressed like an issue right up front. He was like, I think he was just thinking about it at the time, but he was like, how can I have been tortured and, and enjoyed and am able to torture other people? And he was like, I can't answer that, but I do. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like a, it was weird how he was able to just like make it make sense in a very like morally gray area. And Specifically, he has so he has trouble with his identity, seeing himself as a cripple because before he was crippled, he was a dashing officer, rising star of the union, won the fencing tournament. He was like the sexiest man alive, right? If they if they had such a thing um, in the in the circle of the world, but now he's crippled and this and somewhat ugly. And he's got all these issues, and he has trouble. He he has trouble just accepting that as a person. And I have similar thoughts. Let me tell you. I mean, um, I've been disabled for eight or nine years now, 
And I think Glocked is actually about the same amount of time. And sometimes I'm like, seriously, this is, you know, this is my identity. And it's, it's hard to, it's hard to accept. And I think the way that he, the, the thoughts that come to mind are, are really realistic, really good. Yeah. And I think that part of the, part of the way that that, that it's written really well is the fact that um, Giselle is such a good foil to that. He's like, the way I kind of thought about it was he was what Glockta was 10 years ago. That's Giselle now. And so it's kind of, there's a really good foil built in right from the beginning. Which is why Glockta hates him so much, right? Yeah. Because he represents all that he could have had. And you get that more and more as the story goes on, I feel like. I feel like at first you're just, you don't quite understand why Glockta hates him so much because you, you get more and more of Glockta's backstory. And it starts making more and more sense as you read about his character and learn about him. And also, I think Glockta's character is where Joe Abercrombie's writing uh, shines the most. I think that he he has the most distinct voice. And you just get a lot added when you're reading uh, Glockta's descriptions. So I think all of his main characters have a very distinct voice to them. He writes each of them in a, in a separate way. And they all kind of have like their little quirks. For example, Glockta's neck is always clicking when it's his parts. Logan has his little sayings, like like we've been saying, Ben and I, uh, you know, say one thing for Logan Nine Fingers, say that whatever it is that he's currently doing, and he always mutters he's still alive. And a lot of the Northmen have ways of talking that characterize them because they are not as educated and they talk in in simpler terms. And he catches that really well. Jazal is this pompous arrogant nobleman and that's carry that's characterized in the way that he talks and the way that things are described when it's his point of view yeah it's it's amazing it's amazing writing and it makes you fall in love with the characters even even though they're not good people all of them and even though they all have issues and that's why i think that he really had to nail that writing is because he knew that he was going to have his characters do some pretty messed up things so he needed to give them strong personalities and a strong voice yeah well, yeah, were you guys able were you, were you guys able to cheer for the characters all the times or were there times where you were like man even though I'm getting this person's point of view I do not like them and I want them to fail I think that a lot of the torture scenes with Glockta I was rooting him for him to fail <laughs> cuz I just I couldn't stomach it all the time so I was like oh I hope you don't get the information you're after <laughs> Honestly for me I'll say even though they weren't up to great things I was always rooting for him. That's how strongly I felt that I was in their heads. And I feel like the more that you're in someone's head, especially when you're reading, when you're reading a book and you get their thoughts, the more you understand them and the more you want them to do well, because even in this book, like their base motivations are they're trying to do well for themselves, at least like they're not pure evil people. And that's a strong enough motivation for me to hope that they the hope that they do well most of the time. So Steven's baseline is, as long as you're not absolutely evil, then then I'm cheering for you. (laughs) I guess what I'm saying is, when you see people out on the street, they're probably not evil. They're probably just trying to do well for themselves. And if when you read a book and you get that level of, you get you get that entry into people's heads, that helps you understand that. Looking around, if I if I could understand people in the same way that I can when I read a book about characters, then I would like almost everyone. You know, that is a, that is a very hopeful way of viewing the world. And I, I'm sure it's true. You know, most of the time when you, when you really get to know somebody, they end up being a very decent human. So anything from this book, specifically from book one, that you guys want to call out? There wasn't really a whole lot of action, to be honest. It was mostly a, a character book and an intro yeah that's why i struggled with the most in book one if we're going to say anything negative about it i did not find the plot all that compelling just not a whole lot happened you know i mean stuff happened but it didn't i didn't keep reading to find out what happened next i guess yeah i mean i looking back on it i can't even remember what like the main conflict or the resolution was to book one the main thing that drove the action on was the tournament that was happening right the the fencing tournament Giselle was was preparing for that, and Logan was. They were all kind of coming together into Adua, the capital city, at the same time for the tournament. That's when they all met met up. 
there was this looming threat of whatever Glockta was investigating. You knew that these these Northmen under Bethod were uniting. So there were a lot of things, kind of rumors that you were hearing about, and there wasn't a lot of direct action. But the tournament was the main thing, and, and that was the highlight for me. That was exciting. Yeah, and that might honestly be like we've talked about. Like that's pretty realistic too. You know what I mean? Like a lot of a lot of times in life, the main exciting things that are happening are kind of manufactured, similar to like the tournament. You know, it's kind of a manufactured thing that that humans have created to to give their lives some purpose. And then the kind of actual important stuff kind of remains nebulous and, and kind of off camera a lot of the time. I kept waiting for bias to be a little bit more exciting in book one. And I, I feel like he was a really cool character that I didn't get a whole lot out of in book one that definitely changes throughout the series. But yeah, book one, I was disappointed that not a whole lot happened with him. Yeah. You don't really get, too much of him doing stuff until book three yeah okay so should we should we move on and summarize book two yes sir book two is called before they are hanged also the titles on these books right so so poetic but also so grim so the the titles are actually from poets the blade itself is a quote from homer in the odyssey before they're hanged is a title of the second book references a quote by heinrich Hein, we should forgive our enemies, but not before they are hanged. And the last argument of kings um, refers to the words of uh, Louis the Fourteenth, as he inscribed on his canons, "Ultima ratio regime," which is Latin for the last argument of kings. So that's a little bit of trivia for you. I like it. Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, did he end his life with his head attached to his body, or no? <laughs> Click that hyperlink, Josh. Click it. Which one? Which one is the fourteenth? Is, is he the Sun King? I, I took AP U.S. History or not U.S. World or whatever it was. He's the longest record of any monarch of a sovereign country in European history. Okay, so he did. He did well for himself. He probably didn't get guillotined. Stephen, did you get a five on that on that AP U.S. History test? Oh, you know it. You know it. Although that wasn't that wasn't U.S. Right? We're we're in France, so yeah. There's there's my five. I know the difference between U.S. and France. Okay, book two. So book one ends with our heroes traveling. Uh, they, they've, they've had a conflict in Adua and in the capital city. And they are now gearing up for an unknown adventure with Baez. And for some reason, they agree to go with him. And Glockta is being sent off to Degaska, which is a, bordering, a, a country bordering a hostile nation called Gurkle. Kind of a dumb name there. Didn't really love that name. Uh, so, so we're all kind of going off in d- different directions, and Superior Glockta has a problem. How do you defend a city surrounded by enemies and riddled with traitors when your allies can by no means be trusted and your predecessor vanished without a trace? It's enough to make a torturer want to run, if he could even walk without a stick. Northmen have spilled over the border of England and are spreading fire and death across the frozen country. Crown Prince Ladislaw is supposed to drive them back and win undying glory. There's only one problem. He commands the worst armed, worst trained, worst led army in the world. And Baez, the first of the Magi, is leading a party of bold adventurers on a perilous mission through the ruins of the past. The most hated woman in the south, Pharaoh, the most feared man in the north, Logan, and the most selfish boy in the Union, Giselle, make a strange alliance but a deadly one. They might even stand a chance of saving mankind from the Eaters if they don't hate each other quite so much. Ancient secrets will be uncovered, bloody battles will be won, and lost. Bitter enemies will be forgiven, but not before they are hanged. Again, you just get the feel of it, right? Yeah, that was a sweet description. I think I think you even, just from that description, it's it's much more apparent that there's a little bit more kind of world building and stuff that happens in, in the second book. In my opinion, I think the second book was my favorite. Um, and we'll get to the end why I had some issues with the end of the series. But I liked the second book the most. I enjoyed the plot. I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed the little journey that they were on. It kind of felt like a D&D campaign almost. I enjoyed Glockta defending the city and fighting an uphill battle that you knew he was going to eventually lose. Uh, I just really enjoyed it and was really compelled by it. And as 
for as little plot as the first book, the second book crammed a whole lot of plot in there. I'll go opposite. The second book was my least favorite. I like the third book a lot. I like the first book decently. The second book, maybe it's... I have a history of not liking middle books, so there's probably something there. But I felt like the journey that they were on, that, that most of our characters were on, was a journey to nowhere. And I understand that he's basically like converting the the, uh, the trope there in doing that. But I didn't like it. It felt so pointless and... I don't know. I'm okay with inverting tropes, but I feel like you got to go somewhere. Have to be realistic about these things, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the point, though, of these books is that, like, there's times when you just go on an epic journey and you get there and you're like, well, this kind of sucks. You know, I feel like that with most tourist attractions I kind of go to when, I, when I'm traveling. I go there and I'm like, okay, all right, this is cool, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, almost everything in the world is overrated. That's for sure. <laughs> Except for this podcast. Besides fantasy books. <laughs> that's right. Phantology podcast is yeah. underrated. <laughs> so did this book end with them kind of getting to that island and then realizing that what the random thing that they were looking for that was going to save the world wasn't there? Exactly. The random thing they were looking for, the seed. We have no idea what this... In, in the entirety of this book... We have no idea what this seed is. What the heck is this thing? And they finally go on this long journey to nowhere. This whole, this big red herring that Joe Abercrombie is just giving his listeners a huge middle finger on. <laughs> and there's nothing there at the end. Come on, man. That's It's totally what this book is designed for. You just go and you're expecting it and then nothing turns out. And that's part of what makes the reading compelling in my mind. I feel like in this case, it was too much. And he could have, I'm fine with them not finding the seed. But why couldn't they have found something else or learned some vital piece of knowledge or something? I felt like the only point of the, the whole journey was to build up the world and to add to the backstory and the mythology of the Maker and Juvens and all of these like old Magi and stuff that's set up for the third book. But why couldn't there have been a little bit of a payoff at least? You're reading a whole book. Let's give us some payoff at the end. Yeah, I think that there's some payoff with, with the character development. But, you know, obviously you need some more to the plot. So I agree with you there. All right. I, I was I was there for the journey. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the uh, Luther's uh, character development. I, I, I liked it. Yeah, I mean, journey before destination is all well and good, but you still need a destination. If I was swearing the ideals, journey before destination would be hardest for me. I'll freely admit that. <laughs> Well, okay, so so we got that part of the book. What what did you think about Glockta's experience? I liked the Glockta adventure quite a bit. I do think it was a bit of like a short story almost. Like it, it would have it would have been fine as a standalone, and there wasn't a whole lot of tie in between the first and third books on his story. So, in my opinion, uh, Palace Intrigue is either the most boring things that thing that a book can have, or one of the most entertaining that a book can have. And I really liked the intrigue in this book. I really liked that he literally couldn't trust anyone, that there is a driving mystery behind his time there, that you were trying to figure it, uh, figure it out along with him. I, en I really enjoyed his parts. Yeah, I think I enjoyed it, but I also kind of just wrote it off in my head. I was like, oh, this is a part of the book that I don't necessarily have to pay attention to or understand because it was a little bit more removed. I think that was my struggle as well, but I did really like it when I allowed myself to get into it. For me, the whole time I'm like, could he pull this off? I think he's going to pull this off. No, he's not going to pull this off. It's it's uh, you know first law book. He can't pull this off. But I was I kept hoping that he would, knowing that he wouldn't. In terms of actually, you mean actually succeeding in defending the city? I exactly. It, like in terms of turning it away and saving the city. There, there. Uh, now that I think about it, there was more connection to the end of the series than I previously gave credit for, like the Valentin and Bank or Valentin Bulk, whatever you know, the bank that loaned him the million marks. That's obviously really important. It started, uh, it, it started getting into Gurkle and the Eaters, and that was very important. But this kind of leads into another criticism I had was that the backstory, with the amount of importance the backstory had at the end of the book. I felt like it was not fleshed out enough for me to to really get the payoff. Like after going back and looking through some of the summaries and rereads, I'm like, okay, this is this and this is this. 
and this is who this character was and why it was so important at the end of the book. But as I, in my first read, I was a little confused. And maybe we're kind of getting into the third book now. But you see what I'm saying? Yeah, for sure. I, I agree with you. And honestly, this might be me as a reader, but whenever I'm confused about something, I just think I'm meant to be confused about it. But I, I should probably pay more attention with, you know, and try not to be as confused. But that's fair. And sometimes audiobooks contribute to that. L- let me just let me summarize it this way. So one of Sanderson's laws of magic, if you've listened to his lecture series like we have because we're tremendous nerds but one of his laws of magic is the ability i'm gonna bungle this but the ability or the importance you put on magic to solve problems is proportional to the amount of explanation and fleshing out of the magic that you do so if you want magic to do something cool you have to explain to your readers why it can do that thing and why it makes sense that you're going to solve the problem in this way So I'm going to say the same for, this is similar to plot elements in this book. I don't think that Abercrombie spends enough time fleshing out the backstory and the magic and the world. I don't think that has has, has enough proportionality to the ultimate ending where that is so vital to what's happening. Yeah, so I agree with that. I feel like, so I have not read... The Song of Ice and Fire books, I've only watched the TV, the Game of Thrones TV show. And I feel like it was similar to the White Walkers, where there was some attempt made at developing a backstory for why they existed, but not very much attempt. And unless you really took time to piece everything together, you weren't going to understand it. And so that's kind of how I felt with this book, too. Like the main big bad threat of the Eaters weren't something that that you are going to understand unless you put a lot of effort into figuring out clues from random paragraphs throughout the books. The Game of Thrones TV show did a terrible job with the White Walkers. That's my number one criticism. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, and well, this leads us into a little conversation about the magic system in the series as a whole. It was not very well defined. Um, Baez was a little bit like Gandalf in that sense of like, when he needs to do something, he can. I know that there's going to be, you know, I know that that's not actually the case in Lord of the Rings, that there's actually reasons and da, 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 da. But, you know, that's the, it's not a hard magic system. And that doesn't mean it's bad. In fact, I think it kind of contributes to the grittiness of the, of the book series and the lack of, like you're saying, fantastical elements. It makes it a more human story as opposed to a more magic story. So I think that, this the magic in this book the magic in this series isn't a bad thing but it's not very well defined yeah so i think that we've talked a lot about the second book and i think we have a pretty good handle on on what happened there let's uh read a little summary about the third book and then go full full on for spoilers book three the last argument of kings as we know a quote from louis the 14th who whose head may or may not be attached to his body the end is coming Logan Ninefingers might only have one more fight in him, but it's going to be a big one. Battle rages across the north, the king of the Northmen still stands firm, and there's only one man who can stop him, his oldest friend and his oldest enemy. Time for the Bloody Nine to come home. With too many masters and too little time, Superior Glockta is fighting a different kind of war, a secret struggle in which no one is safe and no one can be trusted. His days with the sword are far behind him, it's a good thing blackmail, threats, and torture still work well enough. Jazal Dan Luthar has decided that winning glory is far too painful and turned his back on soldiering for the simple life with the woman he loves. But love can be painful too, and glory has a nasty habit of creeping up on a man when he least expects expects it. While the king of the Union lies on his deathbed, the the peasants revolt and nobles scramble to steal his crown. No one believes that the shadow of war is falling across the very heart of the Union. The first of the Magi has a plan to save the world as he always does. There is no risk more terrible, after all, than to break the first law. And the first law is, thou shalt not converse with demons. Yeah, this book was a book about payoffs, I think. You had a lot of uh, plot threads leading up and not knowing where they were going. And uh, this book, you got a lot of payoff in it. And I think that that, that summary teased that up really well. Man, this is one of my... I'm going to have to revamp my top fantasy book ranks. But I think this book might make top five. This book is really good. I really liked it. 
So did you like it because it gave you the payoff that you're hoping for or, or what, why did you love it so much? Just everything. The characters were still fantastic. And by this time I was really familiar with them. So they continued to be, they continued to be solid. And then, yeah, things were finally starting to pay off. I do have some criticisms and a lot of things that I just hinted at. There was a lot of action. There was a lot of uh, mystery and, uh, and political stuff going on. And I thought it was done well. Really liked it. I think that there were a lot of things that were pretty forgettable about the book, but there are also a lot of things that really stuck with me. So for example, one of the things I found forgettable was the romance between Giselle and whoever. And Artie? Yeah. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I know, Stephen, you're a sucker for, for a pretty girl. So what happened there? This was one of the more interesting romances that you have in books because typically this would be a happy story right Jazal would realize his selfish selfishness he would go home he would fall in love with the girl the girl would be this strong and independent woman and but they would make the romance work etc like that's how your typical book ends this didn't end that way right like they got together for a while and then once Jazal was crowned king he became kind of selfish again and he was unable to make things work with her she ended up getting together with Glockta, right? Like, talk about <laughs> yeah. subverting tropes. That was awesome, man. That was my favorite part of the series. And I, at first, when they teed it up, I thought I was going to hate it. it. It gave some foreshadowing with Glockta going, you know, going to the house and you thought, oh, is he going to kill her? You know, that's kind of what he was going for. But I, I didn't actually think he was going to kill her. That was one time where I was like, there's no way he's really going to kill her, right? That would be, that would be a step too far. I just really liked how that ended. And especially comparing with the entire book, Glockta was comparing uh, Luther to himself. And and that's you get that final thing that Luther wanted the most was, I think, to be loved by someone and to love someone. And he didn't get that, but Glockta did. So I thought it was crazy how how Luther just totally lost all of the progress he had made once he was offered kingdomship or whatever. He just... And he got trounced on in book two. And the whole book, he was like, oh, man, if, if ever I'm back, all I want is to like live with the woman I love and have a kids, have kids on a farm. You know what I mean? Like he was at that point. It shows how like power corrupts. And, and it did a really good job of exploring that theme. So I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But I wouldn't say all of his progress was lost, right? There was a scene at the end after the war had gone down where Jazal was going through, well, the king, right, was going through the hospital tents and talking with everyone, and he was very concerned about the individuals in his nation. So I think ultimately he became a better person, but he wasn't able to, at least in this series, we don't see any sign that he was able to really take control and, and be the powerful king. He was still the puppet of the ultimate master who is Baez. And I, I think that that's really interesting as well, because that's that's how I think life is, you know, take financial stress. I feel like um, when I've gone through financial issues in life, when I don't have enough money or whatever, and I'm just like, I'm whenever I make money, I'm going to save everything. I'm going to stick to a budget. I'm going to, you know, make sure that I'm always taken care of. And then when I, you know, get out of it, I, I don't. I go learn less of a lesson than I think I am when I'm going through it. And I think that applies to a lot of things in life is you just always think you're being changed by what you're going through. When in reality, if you take away 10% of what you learn and apply that to your life, that's good. Marginally better is what you should expect from a, from a real person just to become marginally better from these experiences. And as long as they're doing that, then that's acceptable. And I think you see that, right? Giselle is kind of doing what he can. Logan is becoming somewhat of a better person. Glockta is somewhat settling down. He's he's probably not actively torturing anymore. He probably is someone else doing the torturing <laughs> for him now. So he's becoming a better person, right? I think that the most heartbreaking scene of the whole series for me was when when Luther got back to Artie and he almost kind of like raped her in a in a way, you know? Like it was it was sad. You know, like they're both I don't know. It, it was just such a bleak moment of here's at the very beginning. Going. You're talking about the very beginning of the book. Yeah. At the very beginning of the yeah, book. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I was just so excited for him to come home and bros pedals and happiness and you know like he's changed she's changed you know and it was just heartbreaking because you kind of that was like that was the foreshadowing and that it wouldn't work out it was like these characters are going to be together but they're not happy together or they're not going their happiness won't last right and and then with his queen he never there's no signs that he ever had any happiness right like locked up manipulated her into acting like she was the, the loving queen. But the some of the scenes at the end, you see that Giselle is still kind of flexumed in their relationship and doesn't really believe that it's real, and it's not. That was, again, like, that whole relationship between Glockta and, and Luther was just so interesting. That's probably, you know, thinking about it, that's probably my favorite aspect of the book. I loved seeing Giselle get crowned. That That scene was really great because you saw it through so many different characters' eyes. You saw it through Glockta's eyes. You saw kind of Giselle as he was realizing what was happening. You saw it through Pharaoh's eyes. As she, she was just laughing like, this wimpy pink is going to be the king. She couldn't believe it. That was really funny. Did you just use a insult from uh, from Red Rising to describe a <laughs> Luther? No, no. Well, I, I guess so, right? Because the, the pinks in Red Rising are, are a subclass, but that's also what Pharaoh calls the, the white people right with the pinks let's talk about pharaoh because we up until now we haven't talked about her let's talk about her pharaoh and logan and their relationship because that was a lot in this book they seem like they would be good i i don't know like they were somewhat of good matches for each other like the two barbarians yeah they're all like that's that's a match made in hell right there i mean you gotta <laughs> you gotta jump on that you know I I think I laughed out loud the most um, with their interactions with each other. Neither of them can communicate at all. (laughs) Both of them would rather kill someone than have a full on conversation with them. And yet they're like inexorably drawn to each other in a way that is really uniquely done. And I really enjoyed. And up until the end, you see Logan thinking, man, maybe I should have tried to get with Pharaoh still like she's off in the South doing whatever because both of their storylines kind of end on cliffhangers, right? Pharaoh runs off to Gurkle, still a terrible name, but she runs off down there to try to get more revenge. She's not satisfied with the amount of revenge she's got yet. And Logan goes up North and he, and there's a, a, an attempted coup on him by black Dow, his man, right? Oh, black Dow, and, man. And, and the other, and some of Beth Dodd's cronies are trying to take him down and in he's overwhelmed and he jumps out of a window and is falling into a river and fade to black because we don't know what's happening. And, and really interesting because, because basically that's exactly where he started, right? Like falling off a cliff into a river and all of his people thought he was dead. Yeah. And actually the, uh, the book does a great job of calling back. There's so much foreshadowing and scenes that you see repeated and, and the end of the series calls back to the beginning really well for more than just Logan. Yeah, that that was really good. I like that cliffhanger. I I don't think any of us have read the standalone books, but from what I understand, there's not a resolution to that cliffhanger yet. I know that there are a couple standalones, and then he's starting another series. Um, the this new series is called A Little Hatred. Well, that's the first book, and then he's coming out with the second book later this year. And from just looking at the little Wikipedia fandom blurb one of the main characters in A Little Hatred is the 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 son of Jazal and Adi, who's being raised by Glockta. Or not the son, I think it's a it's actually daughter, right? So so she's one of the main characters. So I assume that we actually are gonna see some of our our friends from this series. Let's talk about now the whole thing with Baez. So he had he had his relationship or his hatred um enemyship, I guess, with Kalul. Kyrule, yeah, and so let's talk about how that that was the whole mystical element of it, and you found out that Baez was actually the person that killed um, his lover, right? The uh, the daughter of the maker. Yeah, the daughter of the ma- maker. Right. So the daughter of the maker. Ah, she has a name. Starts with a T, I think. Yeah. Some of the names of these guys were hard, but uh, she is turns out to be an eater a lot of these people are secretly eaters apparently eating flesh is like a a pastime of people that 
Uh, for whatever that reason. The first law, or was that the second law? I thought no, 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 no. That's the second law. Don't eat flesh. Second law. Second law. First law, don't talk to demons. Sure. Okay. I think there's a third law as well. I can't remember that one. But uh, yeah, yeah. So she ends up jumping on them in the house of the maker. Uh, they just shut her away. And that's kind of the end of that plot line. W- one, of the, uh, one of the other magi sacrifices himself. It, while, while they're getting the seed, because they figure out that the seed is actually in, what's the name of that location, that setting? In the house of the maker? Yeah, in the house of the maker. They find out that the seed is actually there. Well, they don't even figure it out. It, they, just by happenstance, Pharaoh is drawn to it because she has demon blood. Yeah, so yeah, she's yeah. able to be drawn to the. She's like swinging on this giant mobile of planets. It's kind of a that was kind of a fun scene to to find the seed. Yeah, that that was cool. But it, I think it does uh, highlight the the fact that we are not supposed to um, that this magic system is really just vague. You know, like they ju- they just happen to be there. It doesn't. It seems like there's a lot of coincidences that happen when it comes to the magic and the mysticism of this book series. The thing that I don't like about this is there are a few times where it hints at somewhat of a hard magic system. Like Bias talks about there being different types of magic and they're creating a new type of magic with the seed, but that's never explained. Either do it and be soft and just have it be a mystical element or go all in on the hard magic. I don't like the towing of the line that we have here. Well, I don't mind it only because it gives more time for us to focus on the characters. And this book is really about characters. And so I thought it was more more used as a plot device than of a plot element, if that makes sense. It was how can we move the plot along? Then let's give the reader a reason to read this book. The fact that the magic system was incorporated into Logan and Pharaoh as characters, but they never, it was never clear how they were affected by characters as characters by that matter. you mean how, how pharaoh was carrying the seed and logan was talking with spirits that would seem to be a defining part of your personality and really kind of affect everything that you did and it just didn't i don't think for either of those characters let me push back on that because i think this might be something that you missed so both of these characters have demon blood we 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 learn that they are descended from this ancient connection with men and demons. Now Logan has this alter ego, the Bloody Nine, right? And they they talk about that as almost another person. So I think, and there's a lot of fan theories around this, that the Bloody Nine is a demon that's coming out and controlling him. Yeah, so I I agree with that. I remember thinking like similarly to that. It's kind of I almost pictured it more of like the thrill though. I don't know from if you're familiar with Stormlight Archive. But I mean let's not give spoilers for Oathbringer, but we know there's more to that the thrill than just a just a personality thing, right? Yeah, that's true. So I understand the bloody nine part of it. I thought that was really well done. But I don't understand the the talking to spirit part of it. That was weird to me. Also, I didn't understand in like the very first book, it talked about Logan being able to like hold fire in his mouth and like spit it out to make a fire that was never explored. So like, it seemed like there were things that should have affected the character development pertaining to the magic system that didn't. Yeah. I can't disagree with that. I was just about to mention the fire spirit thing too. Yeah. That was odd. I was so ready for like Logan to bust that out as like a random, like ability to take down like a huge enemy. And he, it never happened. I was super bummed. And I think a couple times when he's talking to the spirits, they're like, uh, this is the last time we'll speak to you again because we're disappearing and magic is going away. And okay, I guess. Then why are you? Why do we need to talk to you at all? Yeah, that was odd. So this was the other thing about this book was that I feel like it took tropes from all these other fantasy books and some of them they did really well. Others of them, they did not do very well. One of them that I love that they did was basically was what they did with Baez. I feel like if you were to combine Gandalf and um, Saruman, then you would get Baez from from Lord of the Rings. And um, because he was both like the instigator and pulled all these characters out of their humpy, happy, comfy lives and sent them on some glorious missions. But then he was also like evil, you know, and and was the cause of all these terrible things that was happening to them. 
Yeah, in other books, you always trust the wise wizard character, the Gandalf, the Moraine. You trust these characters to have the best interests of the other characters that don't know what's going on. You, you trust the wise wizard to have their best, best interests at heart and really be doing a noble thing. Maybe you don't understand what they're doing, but you trust that they're doing something that is ultimately going to be for everyone's good. Not the case here, right? Bias is just out for himself. He just wants to be in charge of the union and he wants the union to be in good shape. So he's going to do whatever it takes to get that. But but it's even worse than that because he doesn't even really care about the union. He cares about it as a way to defeat Kaul, who he has just a big grudge against, you know, it's just like a, it's just like a chess piece for him to attack his enemy with. And isn't the conversation with Galacta and Baez at the end perfect with that? Like they're playing, it's not chess, it's squares, right? Every fantasy book has got to have their own little board game, but they're talking over this squares board and Glockta is realizing that Baez is the, the, the funder behind the bank that's in bribing him. And he's realizing that Glockta is really controlling everything. And he's, he's thinking, Oh my gosh, I'm just one of these pieces on the board. And then he's like, Oh no, actually, no, I'm, I'm the space in between the pieces. And then no, I'm the piece of dust in between the pieces <laughs> He's realizing how insignificant he is and what the what the you know stakes really are. That was awesome. There's a lot of scenes like that, that and this is why I say the writing is so awesome. So uh, another amazing part of that scene is when they talk about how it's really money that rules everything. You know what I mean? Like that it wasn't even the magic, it was just that he was able to use them use money and buy people off and buy nations and that's what gave him his power. One other one other thing that I liked about Baez was when you first meet him, Logan looks over and he's like, you're the wizard? Aren't you supposed to be carrying a staff? That was so perfect. <laughs> That's how you meet him, right? No staff, because he's not the wizard that you'd expect. Yeah, but then the thing is, right after that, he goes on to like defend Logan, right? Against like his big bad enemy at the time. So he kind of like, at once, like at the same time, subverts that that expectation but then fulfills it. Uh, you know what I mean? So it's kind of, it's, it's just done really well. One of the tropes that I didn't like as much is that here you have this uh, world that the magic is leaving and it might be on the verge of an industrial revolution or of a democratic revolution. You already got hints that it was like kind of a Republic with the politicking and electing a new King. And while I like that idea, I don't think that it was done as well or that it added a whole lot to the story and could have done without it. I could see that. There's a couple of times where later on some of the uh, some of the high justices are saying, hey, maybe we should make this thing a, a democratic republic and give the people a voice. Yeah. And the other the other guys just just laugh them down a la final season of Game of Thrones. Right. Yeah. I mean, it was basically exactly what happens in Game of Thrones. Ha ha ha, a funny joke. We're not going to do that. Yeah, so I agree, Josh. It was there, but at the same time, you're like, oh, well, for what purpose are they Are they getting at this? It, it almost just found, it seemed like a way to not make the magic as important of like, oh, well, the magic's leaving the world. And I feel like Lord of the Rings and to some extent The Wheel of Time are the only series that have really done that really successfully of making an allegory for um, industri- industrialization ruining magic dark tower does it well as well but i think all these books you know don't don't do it that well how do how does lord of the rings and wheel of time do it well lord of the rings that's a lot of that's really one of the themes of the book is it was um is that uh sauron's industrialization and burning down the trees and is driving out the or what whatever age they're in you know it's causing that age to come into an end and the elves are leaving and you know, like that's the whole theme of the books. Okay. And I guess same with Wheel of Time, especially when you get the flashbacks into the the Age of Legends, right? The industrialization there. Yeah. And Wheel of Time, I guess, is more about a wheel, you know, like cyc- the cyclical nature of things. So, so similar themes. But um, this one, I just didn't feel like it added anything to the book. It almost felt like a way to explain away the lack of magic in it. I can see that. I think that you might be reading a lot into that. I don't know if it was just maybe as intentional or I didn't pick up on that theme, but I don't know. I think a lot of these things that we talk about are things authors actually think about. I don't think there's too many accidents in what you're reading. 
Yeah, you'd hope not. Yeah. So any more tropes that got subverted? Because I think it's a big theme of the series. So, yeah, the knight in sh- shining armor. I mean, you got Luther, who was supposed to be that. Wes, who was supposed to be that a little bit, who we haven't really talked about very much in this. And then they're just not, you know, like they're just pretty bad people. Um, West kills the prince. That, okay, well, that was cool. I mean, that was cool. I, I was cheering for that because the prince was... The prince was like Joffrey, but even more incompetent. But yeah, and that was kind of like a Jamie type moment of like um, only maybe Jamie was a little bit more justified in killing the Mad King because he was literally about to burn his whole kingdom to the or his whole city to the ground. But still, like it was just here's this person that he's kind of supposed to be pre- protecting, and his honor would dictate that he protects. And then he's like seeing him rape a rape a woman, and nope, I'm gonna toss you down a canyon so i think some of the themes that it leans into is just like killing off side characters that you kind of care about i think that might have been done like one too many times you know the reason why i thought about that was didn't the girl that he was raping at that i forget her name but she ended up dying too right yeah her name was like kathis or kalthis or something like that uh too many names yeah, but that was like West's love interest. Cathal, Cathal. I'm going with Cathal. Final, final answer. And she just took an arrow to the gut, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. She died in a pretty gruesome way. She was, she did not go well. Yeah, like, come on. You don't need to like. You just don't need to do that. I mean, maybe the that's the that's what makes it grim dark, though. You know, so maybe yeah. You just he was subverting all the tropes that he like. He subverted every trope besides the tropes that he didn't subvert, which he really didn't into. I think there was a fantastic line towards the end where Glockta is, is speaking and he says, the heroes are the ones that die young and die gloriously. But here we are, you know, crippled, twisted men. He's talking to West because at the end of the book, West gets this mysterious disease and is just, you know, totally waylaid and he's losing his teeth and he's, uh, he's not dead yet, but he seems like he's going that way. And Glockta is saying, you know, here we are, the survivors, the men that have done so much and we're wasting away and we're not heroes any longer, but the heroes, they were the ones who were fighting and died gloriously. Yeah, it's kind of like a Batman moment, right? Like you either die, die a hero, live long enough to find yourself become a villain, you know? Yeah. Another somewhat grimdark, grimdark tale, right? Yeah. So, okay, here's my hot take for the series is I was legit disappointed that none of our main characters died. Yep, I mean, that's on my notes as well. Yeah, we're on a we're on a cliffhanger, I guess, with uh, with Logan, and I, I get. I mean, okay, taken individually, I like where most of these characters end up, right? I think that it's poetic a lot of the time. I think that um, it makes sense with their character, and I like each of them taken individually. But just going into this book, hearing that it was so grim dark and hearing that it was beat down on characters so much, which it did. And I'm not saying it didn't, but then just to have none of the characters actually die besides some side characters, it was kind of disappointing. <laughs> and that, and I sound pretty messed up for saying that. One of the themes repeated throughout the book was basically men are men. They die when they die. A lot of times it's just luck and they go back to the mud and I thought it would have been a very poetic ending if one of these guys was to just randomly take an arrow and die. Because that's what the series is trying to to go towards. And the fact that, like, that kind of goes back to my complaint of he does that, only it's just with side characters. Like, you got to kind of, you know, get some guts and do it to a main character, you know? And And I think that, as an author, that would be super hard, right? Because especially he's he's written these characters so well. So you don't want to just like kill off a character that you've written so well, you know? Well, you're at the end of the series anyway. They're going to die. That's true. That's true. Yep. Do you think possibly he was concerned it was too much like A Song of Ice and Fire and was like, eh, I'm not going to kill my main characters because then the comparison would be too strong? I mean, possibly. I mean, Joe Abercrombie, if you want to come on the podcast, you can, uh, you know, you're invited. Yeah, exp- explain to us why he didn't kill kill at least one person, which I guess he kind of killed West off. Like, there's not a whole much of um, hope that he's coming back from that, you know? Well, they said some people survive, but he's pretty wasted. Yeah. yeah. 
maybe right, maybe yeah. he's the next torturer. <laughs> yeah, after after being crippled, now he's going to become the yeah. yeah. I don't know. He, that's not in his personality. I don't think. No. Uh, so final thing for me was the climax. Was the pl- cl- climax was pretty strong. You saw a lot of the plot elements come together. Still have the criticisms on the uh, the whole magic thing and all of the magi and all, that whole black story. I felt was just not iterated quite enough because you didn't get to see them. You just heard about them. So you never actually saw that. And then when that turned out to be the when that turned out to be the reason why things were happening, it was a little confusing, disappointing to me. But my final hot take is the falling action. I'm I'm so conflicted on because on one hand, I really liked it. I really liked Glockta becoming full on Tyrion Lannister and going through and and politicking and the small council and it was totally Game of Thrones, uh, Red Keep, King's Landing type politics going on, done really well. We we've seen that a little bit throughout the series, but I thought, man, after reading the falling action at the very end of the book, I wanted more of that throughout the series. But at the same time, the book is almost over. We're getting all this falling action where we're discovering new, new some new plot threads and everything, and. I don't know if it was exactly the best way to do it, at least not the traditional way to do it. Yeah, it, I think it was hoping to to set some stuff up for a follow-up trilogy, right? Like, it was falling action slash exposition for for the next trilogy. I, I kind of thought it was more because he he wanted to explain what was all going on behind the scenes the entire time, but didn't wasn't able to fit it in. So it's kind of like pull back the curtain and have the characters take a final bow type thing. A little bit like that. Kind of similar to what we saw at the end of Lightbringer, at the end of Burning White. Whoa, whoa, where, whoa. For, for well, no, I mean, there's no spoilers here, but all the characters just kind of get their final bow and it goes on for a little too long. And it, I don't know. I, I don't always love that. Yeah, fair. But like we've talked about in other podcasts, endings are hard. I thought this ending was, was pretty solid. Yeah, this ending was really solid. Um. And Stephen, I think that you need to give credit where credit is due with your uh, pet peeve about naming conventions in books. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. You're saying that this is pretty good? Yeah. I mean, most of the names were pretty normal names that weren't uh, completely like just Billy and Bob and Joe or whatever. Like they were still unique names without being hard names. In addition to that, there were characters coming from many different backgrounds. And each of the backgrounds had a separate flair to their names. The Northmen, the named men, right? That was awesome. Some of the some of the men, some of the men in the North aren't even cool enough to earn names. But the ones that did were like Dogmen, Three Trees, Black Dow, the Thunderhead. Cool names, yeah. right? So and, and names that are easy to remember. You could have gone full on weird with the North names. He didn't. I like that. Yeah. And then the union names were often like three names, Jazal, Dan Luther, San Dan Glockta, for example, gave you a flair for, okay, these guys are a little more civilized, they're kind of pompous. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then the names from, from the Magi were kind of this magical mysticism. Mm, still a little hard to remember, so I can't give the naming 10 out of 10. Look, any names that I can't remember after reading the series, that's too far. I should be able, as a reader, to remember the names. <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah, I really like the names in this, and I, I figured you would too. So I wanted to give you a little chance to praise that. That's right. Some of the best naming. Look, I really like the book. I really like the series for a lot of reasons. That's why people are obsessed with the series. And I want to eventually do a reread of the series. I want to get through, you know, maybe, do we know when A Little Hate? The next book, so the sequel to A Little Hatred, Trouble with Peace, is coming out. He tweeted out September. I don't know if that's a solid date from the publisher or not, but it sounds like at least later this year we can expect that. So yeah, I want to read those two books. Yeah, hopefully we can get reviews out. And can we give some credit too? Because all three of these good books came out 2006, 2007, 2008. I mean, in a world of waiting for five years between books, this this is you know pretty solid. Do we know if he's written anything else since then? I mean, in 20, 2008 was 12 years ago. I know he's written some standalones. Has he written any other series? Yeah, I mean, standalone, Best Served Cold, 2009, The Heroes, 2011, Red Country, 2012. When did he do his more YA series? I, I read that one. Um, half a War, Half a King, and Half a... Is that the Shattered Sea series? I believe so, yeah. 
Oh yeah, that was that was more recently. That that won the 2015 Locus Award for best YA book. Yeah, so I actually read those um, before I really knew who Joe Abercrombie was. They were just featured on the library app I use, and I was like, "That looks kind of cool," and I breezed through the series. That was that was fun. You know, we talk about Sanderson being the most prolific author kind of around right now, but Abercrombie pumps stuff out too. Yeah, the thing is, it's okay. Look, it's okay if you take time between between series you know like once you start a series i think you have somewhat of an obligation to finish it i know that's finish it in a timely manner it's kind of a hot take which there's going to be people that disagree with that statement i know it's art and that art sometimes can't be rushed but i think you've signed a contract with your fan base that says that they should have some type of resolution in a timely manner and he pulled through with this so props to that yeah yeah and he came out with a little hatred in september of 19 and he's announcing the Trouble with Peace in September 2020, one year for a writing and release of a book. I mean, that's incredible. Well, especially for books that are as well written as these. And really well reviewed. A Little Hatred has awesome Goodreads reviews, and Daniel Green raved about it on his channel. He gave it like the top book of the year. Okay, uh, let's, before we get too far out of the series, let's do our uh, be- worst of the best. I always struggle with getting that out. That's right, we're subverting the plots. So for me, Mine was the the one of the best moments I thought was uh, Nine Fingers in the duel with um, the big bad guy whose name I'm forgetting. Um, the feared, the feared, right? The guy with half his body is half one color, half the other color. Yeah, and half of him is magical and impenetrable. Yeah, so you have him battling it out with that guy, and then on the other inside the keep, you just have um, Dogman. Yeah, Dogman and um the other northmen sneaking in and then see this is when i wish that they could have killed someone off like it would have been a good time like you have um them going up and battling this witch who's like kind of been making beth odds uh, whole ability to rule the north if possible and then they just kill her like they just go walk in the mo- room and they and she kind of stuns a few of them but then somebody else walks up behind her and kills her like that's when they on one hand, you have something so epic happening, and then on the other hand, you have something so anticlimactic happening. Yeah, and I'm going to double down on that worst of the best for another reason. That being, I didn't understand what the witch was doing and why or how the feared was magical. He said he was this ancient guy who's been around since the Magi had been around. I don't get it. The witch is powering him somehow because they kill the witch. And then he's now able to be killed by Logan. It didn't make sense to me. Maybe I missed something there, but I just didn't get it. I thought that was that was going to be a larger threat. Yeah, and then he just kills him. You know, this this three book threat. Like, okay, well, it's over now because you know they killed the feared because they killed the witch in an anticlimactic way. It was it was epic and uh, a letdown at the same time. And the whole time, Bethod, aka Cersei Lannister, in this comparison, is sitting at the top of his keep, sipping his wine, watching, and then Logan strolls up there and kills him. He does nothing. This threat that's been considered to, uh, you know, something mysterious threat that's going to take out the Union, nothing, right? He just throws him off the tower, dead. Yeah, good worst of the best. I was actually thinking about that as well. I think my worst of the best was... And I might get some of the details here wrong because it's been a while, but I I loved when when Dogman distracted kind of the whole army, like the whole army, and took them up into the hills with the one crazy guy that like were the barbarian dude. Yeah, I don't I don't remember that guy's name. The the crazy Northman with the two with the children that were something moons. Uh, well. He was the guy who, was, who said Logan was beloved of the moon. Yeah, sure. That guy. Yeah, I, I, yeah, whatever. So they come up with this plan to to lead the opposing army up into the mountains and get to the stronghold and and allow the the rest of the their army to come up and kind of surround them and take them out. And the whole time as a reader, you're expecting like West's army to not do that because West isn't in charge at that point or whatever. And you're expecting Dogman's crew just to get like taken out. And I felt like the fact that they, he didn't subvert that, like, because 
obviously like the army kind of ends up coming out and coming up and saving the day. And I thought that they needed to have kind of the Northmen earn their stripes by fighting their way out of that and still coming out victorious and owing the other army, like not owing them anything. And in fact, like having a renewed hatred of each other. So anyway, that was, I really liked the setup there. I didn't like how it was resolved. It still made sense. Like I'm not saying it was terrible, but I, I wish that there would have been a different resolution to that. That makes total. I understand your criticism totally because that scene was essentially the equivalent of a couple scenes of Lord of the Rings, which is the trope that he's trying to subvert. The, the scenes that I'm talking about are scenes where the army is fighting and they're about to be destroyed. And then on the horizon, Gandalf arrives. Yeah. Or here comes Rohan in their cavalry to save the day. The cavalry arriving is such a trope. And, yeah. and it happens here and you're just kind of wondering, why the, the book's not supposed to do this? Which it kind of gets into the whole... If you're going into the book knowing that's supposed to subvert tropes, by not subverting tropes, are you subverting that trope of subverting tropes? You know what I mean? It's kind of like, yeah, you kind of set yourself up for failure when you write yourself as an author that consistently subverts tropes. Uh, I think you took me too far on that one. That, that, well, that's my hot take, is you shouldn't have the goal be to subvert tropes. Otherwise, whenever you don't subvert a trope, you've fallen into your trope of subverting tropes. That might be kind of an issue with how this book is covered and we covered it too like this of here's this uh book that isn't afraid to shy away from dark things and really personal and human things but first and foremost it told a really good story and it had a lot of plot details and plot and characters that were really intriguing and very exciting to read about and i don't think it let its desire to subvert tropes or subvert expectations ruin its ability to tell a good story nicely said okay i'll I'll wrap it up my worst of the best is the shenka flathead plot element what are these things i know in the second book they get explained a little bit they are the offspring of some ancient magi wars and they're still around but why are they up in the north what are they doing why can bethod control them yeah can they talk i mean we don't know anything about them right these this, there's somewhat of a red, a giant red herring the whole time, and I, I just wish they were explained a little more. I mean, what, they they could have been, they could have been something that really subverted your expectations and became like some huge twist, and you'd be like, whoa, these Shinka are around the whole time. For example, oh, these Parshmen are around the whole time, and all of a sudden they're really important, right? Yeah. Like, I, I felt like we could have gone there and it would have been cool, but uh, it didn't happen. Let me just tell you, I think my favorite scene out of the entire series was Nine Fingers and Pharaoh in those caves, just like <laughs> totally killing all those um, Shankas, all the, and just like both going ballistic. I thought it was awesome. I was like, this scene is so much fun. Yeah, it almost seemed like those were like just made to highlight.